Section 17 of Great Ghost Stories by Joseph Lewis French. Section 17 Green Branches, Part 2. During the summer months, it was the custom for Katrine and two of the farm girls to go up Mwil Ranza to reside at the shealing of Kanak Anfruk and this because of the hill pasture for the sheep. Kanak an Fruk is a round, boulder-studded hill covered with heather, which has a precipitous quarry on each side, and in front slopes down to Lachen Fruk, a lochlet surrounded by dark woods. Behind the hill, or great hillock rather, lay the shealing, at each weekend, Katrine went down to Ramza Moor, and on every Monday morning at sunrise returned to her heather-girt eyrie. It was on one of these visits that she endured a cruel shock. Her father told her that she must marry someone else than Seamus Akana. He had heard words about him which made a union impossible and indeed he hoped that the man would leave Ranza Beg. In the end he admitted that what he had heard was to the effect that Akana was under a doom of some kind, that he was involved in a blood feud, and moreover that he was Fay. The old man would not be explicit as to the person from whom his information came, but hinted that he was a stranger of rank, probably a laird of the Isles. Besides this, there was word of Ian MacArthur. He was a Thurso in the far north, and would be in Skye before long, and he, her father, had written to him that he might wed Katrine as soon as was practicable. "'Do you see that linty yonder, father?' was her response to this. "'Ay, lass,' And what about the Burdine? Well, when she mates with a hawk, so will I be mating with Ian MacArthur, but not till then. With that she turned and left the house and went back to knock on Fruk. On the way she met Akana. It was that night that for the first time he swam across Loch and Fruk to meet Katrine. The quickest way to reach the shealing was to row across the lochlet, and then ascend by a sheep path that wound through the hazel copses at the base of the hill. Fully half an hour was thus saved, because of the steepness of the precipitous quarries to the right and left. A boat was kept for this purpose, but it was fastened to a shore boulder by a padlocked iron chain the key of which was kept by Donald MacArthur. Latterly, he had refused to let this key out of his possession. For one thing, no doubt he believed he could thus restrain Akana from visiting his daughter. The young man could not approach the shealing from either side without being seen. But that night, soon after the moon was whitening slow in the dark, Katrine stole down to the hazel copse and awaited the coming of her lover. The Lucken was visible from almost any point on Kanak on Fruk, as well as from the south side. To cross it in a boat unseen, if any watcher were near, would be impossible, nor could even a swimmer hope to escape notice unless in the gloom of night or mayhap in the dusk. When, however, she saw, halfway across the water, a spray of green branches slowly moving athwart the surface, she knew that Seamus was keeping his tryst. If, perchance, anyone else saw, he or she would never guess that those derelict rowan branches shrouded Seamus Akina. It was not until the estray had drifted close to the hedge where, hid among the bracken and hazel undergrowth, she awaited him, 
that Katrine described the face of her lover, as with one hand he parted the green sprays, and stared longingly and lovingly at the figure he could just discern in the dim, fragrant obscurity. And as it was this night, so was it many of the nights that followed. Katrine spent the days as in a dream. Not even the news of her cousin Ian's return disturbed her much. One day the inevitable meeting came. She was at Ranzamore, and when a shadow came into the dairy where she was standing, she looked up and saw Ian before her. She thought he appeared taller and stronger than ever, though still not so tall as Seamus, who would appear slim beside the Herculean skyman. But as she looked at his close curling black hair, and thick bull neck and the sullen eyes and the dark wind-red face she wondered that she had ever tolerated him at all he broke the ice at once tell me katrine are you glad to see me back again i am glad that you are home once more safe and sound and will you make it my home for me by coming to live with me as I've asked you again and again. No, as I've told you again and again. He gloomed at her angrily for a few moments before he resumed. I will be asking you this one thing, Katrine, daughter of my father's brother. Do you love that man Achana who lives at Ranzabeg? You may ask the wind why it is from the east or the west, but it won't tell you. You're not the wind's master. If you think I will let this man take you away from me, you are thinking a foolish thing. And you saying a foolisher. I? Ah, sure. What could you do, Ian McKeon? At the worst... You could do no more than kill James Achana. What then? I too would die. You cannot separate us. I would not marry you now, though you were the last man in the world and I the last woman. You are a fool, Katrine MacArthur. Your father has promised you to me, and I tell you this. If you love Achana, you'll save his life only by letting him go away from here. I promise you he will not be here long. Ah, you promise me. But you will not say that thing to James Achana's face. You are a coward. With a muttered oath, the man turned on his heel. Let him beware of me, and you too, Katrine Moniendon. I swear it by my mother's grave and by St. Martin's cross that you will be mine by hook or by crook. The girl smiled scornfully. Slowly she lifted a milk pail. It would be a pity to waste the good milk, Ian Gora, but if you don't go, it is I that will be emptying the pail on you, and then you will be as white without as your heart is within. So you call me witless, do you, Ian Gora? Well, we shall be seeing as to that, and as for the milk, there will be more than milk spilt because of you, Katrine Doan. From that day, though neither Seamus nor Katrine knew of it, a watch was set upon Achana. It could not be long before their secret was discovered, and it was with a savage joy overmastering his sullen rage that Ian MacArthur knew himself the discoverer and conceived his double vengeance. He dreamed gloatingly on both the black thoughts that roamed like ravenous beasts through the solitudes of his heart. But he did not dream that another man was filled with hate because of Katrine's lover another man who had sworn to make her his own, the man who, disguised, was known in Armandale as Donald McLean, and in the North Isles would have been hailed as Gloom Achena. 
There had been steady rain for three days, with a cold, raw wind. On the fourth, the sun shone and set in peace. An evening of quiet beauty followed, warm, fragrant, dusky from the absence of moon or star, though the thin veils of mist promised to disperse as the night grew. There were two men that eve in the undergrowth on the south side of the locklet. Seamus had come earlier than his wont. Impatient for the dusk, he could scarce await the waning of the afterglow. Surely, he thought, he might venture. Suddenly his ears caught the sound of cautious footsteps. Could it be old Donald, perhaps with some inkling of the way in which his daughter saw her lover in despite of all? Or mayhap might it be Ian MacArthur, tracking him as a hunter stalking a stag by the water pools? He crouched and waited. In a few minutes he saw Ian carefully picking his way. The man stopped as he described the green branches, smiled as, with a low rustling, he raised them from the ground. Meanwhile, yet another man watched and waited, though on the farther side of the lochan, where the hazel copses were. Gloom Achana half hoped, half feared the approach of Katrine. It would be sweet to see her again, sweet to slay her lover before her eyes, brother to him though he was. But there was chance that she might descry him, and whether recognizingly or not, warn the swimmer. So it was that he had come there before sundown, and now lay crouched among the bracken underneath a projecting mossy ledge close upon the water where it could scarce be that she or any should see him. As the gloaming deepened, a great stillness reigned. There was no breath of wind. A scarce audible sigh prevailed among the spires of the heather. The cheering of a nightjar throbbed through the darkness. Somewhere a corncrake called its monotonous crick-crack, the dull, harsh sound emphasizing the utter stillness, the pinging of the gnats hovering over and among the sedges made an incessant murmur through the warm, sultry air. There was a splash once as of a fish, then silence, then a lower but more continuous splash, or rather wash of water, a slow susurrus rustled through the dark. Where he lay among the fern, Gloom Akana slowly raised his head, stared through the shadows, and listened intently. If Katrine were waiting there, she was not near. Noiselessly he slid into the water. When he rose, it was under a clump of green branches. These he had cut and secured three hours before. With his left hand he swam slowly, or kept his equipoise in the water. With his right he guided the heavy rowan bow. In his mouth were two objects, one long and thin and dark, the other with an occasional glitter as of a dead fish. His motion was scarcely perceptible. Nonetheless, he was near the middle of the lock, almost as soon as another clump of green branches. Doubtless the swimmer beneath it was confident that he was now safe from observation. The two clumps of green branches drew nearer. The smaller seemed a mere estray, a spray blown down by the recent gale. But all at once the larger clump jerked awkwardly and stopped. Simultaneously, a strange low strain of music came from the other. The strain ceased. The two clumps of green branches remained motionless. Slowly, at last, the larger moved forward. 
it was too dark for the swimmer to see if any one lay hid behind the smaller. When he reached it, he thrust aside the leaves. It was as though a great salmon leaped. There was a splash, and a narrow dark body shot through the gloom. At the end of it something gleamed, then suddenly there was a savage struggle. The inanimate green branches tore this way and that, and surged and swirled. Gasping cries came from the leaves. Again and again the gleaming thing leaped. At the third leap an awful scream shrilled through the silence. The echo of it wailed thrice, with horrible distinctness, in the quarry beyond Kanak on Fruk. Then, after a faint splashing, there was silence once more. One clump of green branches drifted slowly up the locklet. The other moved steadily toward the place whence, a brief while before, it had stirred. Only one thing lived in the heart of Gloom Akana, the joy of his exultation. He had killed his brother Seamus. He had always hated him because of his beauty. Of late he had hated him because he had stood between him, Gloom, and Katrine MacArthur, because he had become her lover. They were all dead now except himself, all the Akanas. He was Akana. When the day came that he would go back to Galloway, there would be a magpie on the first burke, and a screaming jay on the first rowan, and a croaking raven on the first fir. Ay, he would be there suffering, though they knew nothing of him meanwhile. He would be Akana of Akana again. Let those who would stand in his way beware. As for Katrine, perhaps he would take her there, perhaps not. He smiled. These thoughts were the wandering fires in his brain while he slowly swam shoreward under the floating green branches, and as he disengaged himself from them and crawled upward through the bracken. It was at this moment that a third man entered the water from the further shore prepared as he was to come suddenly upon Katrine, Gloom was startled when, in a place of dense shadow, a hand touched his shoulder, and her voice whispered, Seamus, Seamus. The next moment she was in his arms. He could feel her heart beating against his. What is it, Seamus? What was that awful cry? she whispered. For an answer, he put his lips to hers and kissed her again and again. The girl drew back. Some vague instinct warned her. What is it, Seamus? Why don't you speak? He drew her close again. Pulse of my heart, it is I who love you. I who love you best of all. It is I, Gloom Achana. With a cry, she struck him full in the face. He staggered, and in that moment she freed herself. You coward! Katrine, I... Come no nearer. If you do, it will be the death of you. The death of me? Ah, bonny fool that you are. And is it you that will be the death of me? Thy gloomachina, for I have but to scream, and Seamus will be here, and he would kill you like a dog if he knew you did me any harm. Ah, but if there were no Seamus, or any man to come between me and my will, then there would be a woman. Ay, if you overbore me, I would strangle you with my hair, or fix my teeth in your false throat. I was not for knowing you were such a wild cat, but I'll tame you yet, my lass. Aha, wild cat. And as he spoke, he laughed low. It is a true word, Gloom, of the black heart. I am a wild cat, and like a wild cat, I am not to be seized by a fox. And that you will be finding to your cost, 
by the holy Saint Bridget. But now off with you, brother of my man. Your man, ha! Why do you laugh? Sure, I am laughing at a warm white lass like yourself, having a dead man as your lover. A dead man? No answer came. The girl shook with a new fear. Slowly she drew closer till her breath fell warm against the face of the other. He spoke at last. I, a dead man. It is a lie. Where would you be that you were not hearing his goodbye? I'm thinking it was loud enough. It is a lie. It is a lie. No, it is no lie. Seamus is cold enough now. He is low among the weeds by now. I by now, down there in the lochan. What? You, you devil! Is it for killing your own brother you would be? I killed no one. He died his own way. Maybe the cramp took him. Maybe, maybe a kelpie gripped him. I watched. I saw him beneath the green branches. He was dead before he died. I saw it in the white face of him. Then he sank. He's dead. Seamus is dead. Look here, girl, I've always loved you. I swore the oath upon you. You're mine. Sure, you're mine now, Katrine. It is loving you, I am. It will be a south wind for you from this day, Mornir Mokre. See here, I'll show you how I... Back! Back! Murderer! Be stopping that foolishness now, Katrine MacArthur. By the book I am tired of it. I am loving you, and it's having you for mine I am. And if you won't come to me like the dove to its mate... I'll come to you like the hawk to the dove. With a spring he was upon her. In vain she strove to beat him back. His arms held her as a stout grips a rabbit. He pulled her head back and kissed her throat till the strangulating breath sobbed against his ear. With a last despairing effort she screamed the name of the dead man. Seamus! 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 The man who struggled with her laughed. I call away. The heron will be coming through the bracken as soon as Seamus comes to your call. Aye, it is mine you are now, Katrine. He's dead and cold, and you'd best have a living man, and... She fell back, her balance lost in the sudden releasing. What did it mean? Gloom still stood there, but as one frozen... Through the darkness she saw at last that a hand gripped his shoulder. Behind him a black mass vaguely obtruded. For some moments there was absolute silence, and a hoarse voice came out of the dark. You will be knowing now who it is, Gloom Akana. The voice was that of Seamus, who lay dead in the lochan. The murderer shook as in a palsy. With a great effort, slowly he turned his head. He saw a white splatch, the face of the corpse. In this white splatch flamed two burning eyes, the eyes of the soul of the brother whom he had slain. He reeled, staggered as a blind man, and free now of that awful clasp, swayed to and fro as one drunken. Slowly Seamus raised an arm and pointed downward through the wood toward the lochan. Still pointing, he moved swiftly forward. With a cry like a beast, Gloom Akana swung to one side, stumbled, rose, and leaped into the darkness. For some minutes Seamus and Katrine stood, silent, apart, listening to the crashing sound of his flight, the race of the murderer against the pursuing shadow of the grave. End of Section 17 
Green Branches by Fiona MacLeod, Part 2 Please subscribe to update new videos. Please share and like if you enjoyed the video. Thanks so much.